the commemoration of emancipation is not just a calendar event, but a factor in our history that meant the beginning of the Guyanese nation. Marking the anniversary is an occasion for recalling the significance of all these factors, as well to highlight African cultural practices. Today is Emancipation Day, a day when Guyanese, in particular Guyanese of African descent, observe the end of African enslavement and the dawn of freedom from servitude. It contributed to several elements of the social, political, and cultural era of development and was responsible for the subsequent arrival of the indentured immigrants. While several of the African customs are no longer practiced in their original forms, others are still alive and thriving in communities and in normal Guyanese life, and these are colorfully revived on the 1st of August every year. On this InfoHub special, we highlight a few that remain with us today. Now, drumming is the most influential part of the African culture. The music is infectious. It takes over your body and you just, you gotta move. It helps you to connect with your ancestors and even those immediately around you. Matter of fact, you know what? I can find somebody who could explain this better than me. This is Sean Thomas and his student, Tavel, just seven years old, who has a genuine knack for playing the drums, something Sean saw in him when he visited a function. Sean, however, well, he got into drumming by different means. I have learned drumming from my dad by, by just looking because um, my other sister, Aklora, she was the more drummer in doing drumology. So I just used to look on and so on and learn a couple patterns and so the drums and so forth. And then years after, uh, my dad sh showed me how to, you know, hand pattern and so on, how to play different beats and so on, different command T, different um, all nation beats and so forth. And from then on, playing drum, I take a break off. But the drums spoke to him. They called out to him. His ancestors beckoned him. He must return to the drums. I end up in the military um, and then we had a little concert again. I start back, we start playing drums again. And after this mantle of um, the Guyana National Service, um, being in part of the ministry, I meet up with other drummers around, um, great drummers like Mark Cyrus, um, Trevor, Trevor Blackett, he's passed away, but a great drummer. Um, any instrument they, they could play. Now traditionally, the drum was the heartbeat the soul of most African communities. Drums have been an intrinsic part of African life for centuries, and for countless generations, an ancient instrument used to celebrate all the aspects of life, whether it be spiritual or physical. Spiritual, physical, right? You have to be there. I can't just say the spiritual and then the young people are like, what are you talking about spiritual? What do you mean, what do you mean? Right, so, you gotta make them to understand what is it that you want them to understand, but about the drum, what the drum is doing, right? So the drum is basically communication to each and every one of us. But drumming in Guyana is more than just traditional African drumming. There's the Indian Tassa drumming as well. And while the African drums reach far and wide, they call out to us, they speak to us on a different level. They surpass skin, they surpass cultural barriers. The African drums, while distinct from the Indian drums, meld together with the Indian drums. They dance, showing the diversity and inclusivity of the African culture. With the Indian and the, the African drums, it, it, to me, it is no kind of difference with me because I feel the vibe. When the Indian drum feeling, I feel, I feel alive. When the African drum feeling, I feel alive. I don't want to say more alive or, or less alive, but I feel alive because why the drum is to communicate. It could very well be that our cultural similarities can be the starting point to fostering greater social cohesion amongst each other as Guyanese if we merely choose to remember our heritage rather than argue over our history. But to do that, we must ensure that the culture of drumming is instilled in the youth of the nation. It is there, teaching is going on, like we have the, the young Harley Quinn here, 
we can see he's seven years old and he is showing well it is not dead. And the Hebrew family are keeping that culture alive. Right? By teaching the youngsters. Agda also is teaching the youngsters also how to play the drum. So it is there. Before I let him go, there was something I noticed. Before he starts to really drum, he chants, Africa, Africa, where is thy strength? And I just had to know what it meant, why he had to do it. Africa, Africa, where is thy strength? Really and truly what I'm saying here, I'm talking to Guyanese, right? Because we are Afrocentric, we dress Afrocentric. So we're saying, Africa, Africa, where is thy strength? When I suppose saying, Guyanese, Guyanese, where is thy strength? Right? And like I hear in Burial Slave wanted to speak again. Why? Because the drum, the drum is invoking them, causing them to feel, yes, something is going on, something is happening. Our people still there for us. Guyanese cuisine reflects the many cultural influences that have been integrated into our country over time. Whether it's cook-up, black or white pudding, ackee and saltfish or cassava pone, African dishes play a prominent role in the cultural identity of Guyanese. The African influence in local cuisine encompasses the use of vegetables and a variety of fish and meats. Beef, goat and poultry usually accompany starchy recipes of provisions or rice. Creole cuisine, denoting meals belonging to African Guyanese, is an enduring aspect of material African culture left behind after hundreds of years of African enslavement. Those meals usually contain ingredients such as breadfruit, coconut, pigeon peas, plantains, and root vegetables like cassava, edo, yam, salted meat, beef, fish, pork, and seasonings. Creole cuisine is still very popular throughout the year, but especially during the emancipation period and on Sundays. Metamji, or metem as we say for short, is one of those African dishes that is renowned in Guyana. In order to prepare this mouth-watering pot, we first need to purchase a number of key ingredients. And what better place to get fresh produce than at our very own local markets. I am told that the best ground provisions are sold at the back of the Starbuck market, so let's go. To prepare our metem, we use two pounds cassava, two pounds turning plantains, two pounds sweet potatoes, two pounds edos, two pounds flour, two pounds onion, one pound garlic, fine thyme, three coconuts, cubes, eschalot, cornmeal, lime, fish, butter, and oil. Now that we have all that we need, it's time to get down to business. We know a talented chef who will transform these ingredients into a familiar masterpiece. Hi, good afternoon. I was expecting you. Hi, good afternoon. Come in. All right, thank you. Welcome. Chef Tonya Richmond delves into her business and cooking journey. I have a catering service, Tonya and Daughters Catering Service, so various Creole dishes. So how long you've been doing that? About 10 years now. I always had a passion for cooking, okay. but I started at 10 years old. Okay. Yeah. All right, so tell me, what are we making today? I think well, a lot of people are excited, so what well, are we Well, as well you know, we're heading into emancipation, so we're preparing some metamji. So now that we have the provision lineup, it's time to actually get down to peeling them so that we can get this pot going. So the art of cooking this meal is to not really cut too deep into the provision, because remember, you want to make sure that everybody gets to eat. I'm trying my best, I'm not the best cook. That's why I'm taking guidance today. <laughs> So the cassava has already been peeled and next up is of course our edo. Uh, metem is nothing without edo. I know some people don't really like edo like that, but it's a necessity in making metem. Sweet potato is not used in every pot. You know, it's not the average uh, potato you put in your, in your dish. So sweet potato, I find, is a great addition to metem. So I'm gonna try my best to peel it, not go too deep um, underneath the skin. And it's important to make sure that these are fully submerged in water so that you don't get those black spots on your uh, potato. 
want to make sure the provision is looking nice and polished. <laughs> so I'll do my best to not go too deep and make sure that these are properly done. After the provisions were fully peeled and cut to desired sizes, the freshly bought seasoning was washed and blended. Containing echelot, onion, garlic, and fine thyme, the green seasoning is the ideal ingredient for healthily prepared fish. Chef Richmond then outlined the different choices in fish for metem. We have some bangle here, finished cleaning and it's soaking. But not everybody uses bangle to come for metem. Some people use fish head, some people use trout, some people use snapper. It's which are affordable for you. But and, and of course which one you like You like uh, yeah. which one you like to have, but before me metem, don't finish without fish head. You know, my that's my grandfather take and in the old days you would use for instance in the interior you might get the bush fish so you use maracot so maracot would give you a real nice metem people who know about maracot could tell you when you eat a metem with maracot it's a power powerful but we don't have that we have some bangles and it can still be powerful coconuts were grated and the milk was passed through a sieve it is then that the ground provisions, coconut milk, and seasonings were added to a pressure cooker to be cooked. I learned that the pressure cooker is a preferred pot for cooking metem rather than the traditional method in a standard big pot that usually takes a longer time. As things got heated in the kitchen, we transitioned to seasoning the fish, coating it in a whole wheat flour batter, after which it was added to a deep fryer at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Dumplings are an all-time favorite in Metem. Butter, flour, and sugar were added to a container along with baking soda and a few pinches of salt. To provide a nutritional boost, cornmeal was also added to the mix. According to the chef, this is a long-time family recipe imparted by her grandparents. The dumplings, or duff as it is commonly known, was kneaded and boiled in coconut milk. So now that we have finished, finally, um, this looks like a really delicious meal. So Miss Richmond, congratulations on preparing. I don't know how it tastes as yet, but I'm really excited to try it. So what should I look out for? How should I eat this meal? Taste from Tonya's kitchen. Okay, from Tonya's kitchen. Where to? Where should I start? You know what? I'm, 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 I'm just going to start. Just enjoy. Okay, I'm just going to start. All right. Trying to be modest with it. <laughs> if I were home, it, it would be a different situation. <laughs> okay, okay. The bowl is kind of packed. You so. just hold the bowl and just right, eat. Just right. enjoy. Eat wow. This tastes heavenly. I'm, I'm only on halfway on the spoon, but <laughs> but this is really really good. Mm. Amazing work. Let me let me try the fish because I saw how you prepared the batter on this fish and how you season this fish so well. You have to try the duck also, Of course, of course. <laughs> mm. Fish is really fried well. Sometimes people make fish and it's like too soft or too um, crispy. It's, it's the perfect consistency. I've never had whole wheat duff before. Right. It's, 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 I'm gonna take the It's tasty. Yeah, yeah. It's super tough. Just after cooking, I usually don't eat, but I'm okay. gonna eat with okay. the chef. <laughs> okay. Chef Tonya can be contacted on WhatsApp number 6825741 or 6904719, or at the address of 124 Arby Barker Road, South Ramfell Park, Georgetown. Thank you for joining me on this special emancipation production on African foods. I'm with Tonya Richman and we're at DPI's Kitchen. I'm Shaquille Gordon. Take care. Like drumming, African dance links to your roots and our ancestors. The rhythmic body movements combined with music can lift you into another realm. I've always wanted to learn to dance, to dance like free and unrestrained. I'm here with teacher Lynn Medford Ronfis and she'll be teaching us some modern African dance styles. She'll also tell us the significance of each dance move. Let's take a look. Zwa, zwa. 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 
Jumping alongside teacher Lynn, she highlights the various dance styles incorporated in her choreograph. This includes dance styles like the Azonto, originating from a traditional dance called the Kipang Logo, associated with the coastal towns in the country such as Choco, Jamestown, La, Teshinanga, and Tima. You can see the influence of these traditional African tribal dancing throughout many modern dance styles. West African slaves brought to the West Indies and Guyana, one of the many places you can see the influence of African dance in hip-hop where dancers rely heavily on rhythm and free-form movements of the body. African dance has evolved from being more traditional and um, confined to a more open. You find it, it has elements of hip-hop, pop, um, and it depicts several cultures. It still has that foundation, that cultural foundation, but people are having a lot more fun with the, with the dance style. More popular newer dances include the Guara Guara and the Pilolo. So the Ozonto is a very distinct um, dance. It involves a particular movement of your feet where the dancer goes on their toes and they undulate and it's coupled with our movement that, uh, that elevates and you, you can do a lot with the top of your body but it's really a movement with your feet and it is um, a dance from Ghana. For the Pilolo it is um, significant to Ghana also and it is um, more of a quick it's, it's similar to the Michael Jackson um, moonwalk but it's more, it's more of a swift movement and it's quite exciting. You can, the dancers can put a lot of their personality into it. The Guara Guara. Now this is one I really love. Um, it, is, it, it involves the shoulders, a lot of shoulder movement and the, the adjacent leg um, undulates with it. And it, it's, it's quite exciting and when it's done in a group, it looks very, very nice. Dancing is an important aspect of African life. Throughout the various nations of that vast continent, dance was used not only as a form of recreation and entertainment, but more important, to teach social patterns and values to the members of the community. Now that it's time to dance, I'm a bit nervous, but with encouragement from Lynn, I'm ready to give it a try. With my two left feet, it took longer than expected to grasp the steps, but I do have some new moves to show off for the holiday. Before I bow out, Lynn reveals to me a little known fact about a dance move that most of us know. A lot of us, we, we are not aware that the pasta pasta that we used to do, it's not that popular anymore. It's, it's a form of African, modern African dance, and it has a basic, a traditional uh, foundation. Traditional African dance has hundreds upon hundreds of variations and styles, which have been handed down over the generations, keeping it vibrant and adaptable. You know, it has been over 400 years since the first Africans were captured, enslaved, and brought to the Americas via the transatlantic slave trade, rated as the largest crime against humanity in human history. Since then, persons of African descent in the diaspora have been continuing to find lasting ways of preserving the rich African culture. And now we will take you to meet one such person. Fatou Bedema, an energy consultant by profession with a craft and jewelry entrepreneur specializing in African jewelry by trade. We need to now strengthen our relationship among black people on the continent and in the diaspora. And we've been apart for a long time, living our own lives, everybody having their own perception of each other. Um, but like Kwame Nkrumah said, we must unite as um, black people because it's only through unity that you can actually accomplish a lot. And so we have to now bring brains, ideas, experiences together to, to, to transform our lives. Jewelry is art, and art is created through expression of the artist's life, surroundings, and experiences. But Dema explained that African craft making is just one way of reclaiming parts of the lost history of Africans in the diaspora. African jewelry is known for its creative and symbolic nature. Africa is recorded historically as the place where people first wore and made jewelry. The oldest African jewelry were discovered in 2004 in the place called Blombos Cave on the southern tip of South Africa. 
Those jewelry are estimated at being over 75,500 years old. In Kenya, over 40,000 years ago, beads were made from different materials, including wood and various stones. Emancipation is right around the corner, right? And everybody's trying to figure out what's the significance of um, adornment, African adornment, well, and in its in relationship to emancipation. Um, typically, when we talk about emancipation, we're, talking, we're celebrating or commemorating freedom from enslavement. Um, and one of the things that slavery did was to rob us of our culture. Bedema explained that today, most of the original materials for bead making still remain. Materials used today include powdered glass, stone, wood, ivory, eggshells, plastic, seashells, clay, gold, silver, and brass. Excitingly enough, even discarded glass bottles are used to create different colored beads for jewelry making purposes. But Dema creates earrings, necklaces, bracelets, anklets, waist beads, pendants, and custom-made hair accessories, particularly for persons with natural hair, locks, and other protective styles. Jewelry may indicate an individual's power, wealth, personality, characteristics, and their standing in society. African beads have lasted throughout the ages as an element of African adornment and are widely used in African regalia and clothing. I think um, for emancipation, jewelry making or even textile making, um, which have Afri African inspired themes, um, have strong prominence in how we celebrate emancipation because it means that we're putting ourselves back together. All right, we're reclaiming what was lost and now we're using it for um, future um, generation. And I believe that in Guyana, that's something that is missing among Afro-Guyanese. We're losing our, um, our heritage a lot. And so we need to put some of it back. As you can imagine, the bead making process varies depending on the materials used. In some cases, glass is powdered and then reformed into beads. In other instances, materials are melted, colored, and fired in a kiln to produce unique patterns. Whatever the process, different colors hold different symbolisms. And normally it's a mixture of the use of the recycled glass and wire, which you can see here. Um, this is made with the recycled glass, brass, um, and wire. African jewelry is seldom just ornamental. Religion, rituals, and ceremonies play a large part. Jewelry is worn by men, women, and children, in some cases from a very early age and may be replaced at a certain age or status event, like puberty, reaching manhood, or marriage. A lot of people are now going, making brass in Ghana and having either a name or an anchoring you know, word or whatever it is on it. I normally will use words, I will say phoenix, or I will say king, or I will say chief. I will use maybe a traditional language, just a way of teaching people language, African languages, um, that you can mix in your bead, in your bracelet, and then um, mix it with that. So there's been a lot of demand for this. I sat down with Fatu Bedema as she taught me step by step how to make a bracelet using different types of beads. Measuring the wearer's wrist. This is a crucial step to ensure the correct fit on the wrist. Cut the wire or other material being used as a base to make the bracelet to the size measured earlier. This is where it begins to get even more interesting. Choosing beads is perhaps one of the most important parts of the process. While some beads are used for funerals, others for births, others to symbolize a tribe, culture, or status, others symbolize happiness, grief, water, growth, nature, love, connection, and freedom. The most important beads are usually placed at the top of the wrist. As I put together my piece, the entire process felt therapeutic and as if I was reconnecting with my culture in a way one only can through being actively involved in its practice. The beads are usually separated by spacers, other beads that break the sequence of the beads. The arms of the bracelet can be completed with either beads or creatively shaped wire. Finally, Edging closer to the end of the process, clasps are made from two to three inch long cuts of wire, which are bent to accommodate the closers. Closers are added to make the bracelet flow more freely and naturally. 
The two clasps are made to hook into each other and to secure the bracelet onto my hand. Now that the jewelry is complete, I wore my piece proudly as a testament of my involvement in my culture. African jewelry takes many forms and has a number of functions besides bodily adornment. It can be a storage of wealth, amassing gold or precious metals or stones in bracelets and amulets, or it can be a symbol of prestige and power reflecting status in society, or it can just simply be a decorative item used to hold the hair back. Jewelry and craft making is just one aspect of the multitude of culture and traditions left behind by our African ancestors. At the end of the day, me and Nani say, be it dance, it could be craft, it could be food, and I mean I like food, but Whenever the quick we're ready, you gotta get the drum, man. So the drumming <laughs> is by far the best part of the culture. You know, Nicosi, I think that's disputable. But from all of us here at the Department of Public Information, we'd like to wish you a happy emancipation.